Newton. George, I guess, is going to help out there also. I was asked to. <laughs> Do they stand or they sit? All right, if you would like to stand, uh, you may do so at this time. If you would like to remain seated, you may do that also. Come thy fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, out of thy redeeming love. Oh, to grace how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Grown to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Grown to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Oh, let I shall see thy lovely face when I'm clothed in blood washed linen. How I'll sing thy sovereign praise. Come, my Lord, no longer tarry. Take my ransom soul away. Send thine angels now to carry. Than Jesus' blood and righteousness, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand, all of the ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his I rest on his unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil On Christ the solid rock I stand All of the ground is sinking sand All of the ground is sinking sand When he shall come with trumpet sound Oh, for grace to trust Him. 
Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Sit me now. All righty. I want to thank uh, Brother Devon for allowing me to speak this morning. He's at the Baptist State Convention with my son and his wife, and I think Jenny and uh, Melora were with a group playing, praying, uh, playing, singing, leading in music with the uh, Baptist Pastors' Wives Conference. So uh, uh, that went well. They're all coming back today, I think, so keep them in prayer. There's a little a pamphlet on your uh, tables uh, with the guest room. I'm going to talk about that a, a little later in a few minutes, but uh, keep that there. Uh, Ann is not with me today. Uh, Mondays and Tuesdays are usually the days, one or the other, that we go to Raleigh to Rex Rehab, and so today she had an appointment, and she had already changed the schedule once, and she hated to change it again uh, because her therapist is going out of town for a while, so uh, I usually have to drive her because Ann will not drive in Raleigh. And uh, so uh, Judy Raines graciously uh, volunteered to drive Ann today. So that's why she's not here, but otherwise she would be here. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you for this time together. Thank you for everyone gathered here. Thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness of, of this generation uh, to you and to the church. So, Father God, I pray in everything today that, that you would be glorified, that you would be honored, that you would be exalted, Lord, that, that uh, Lord, everybody, everybody, all of us, me and everyone here would, would have our focus on you because, Lord, uh, when we focus on you, Lord, your will is done and, and things go so much better. So, God and lead, we ask in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. Uh, I've got a burden on my heart, and I've shared this with, with you all before. And uh, I, I hope you have a burden, too, for our society today. Uh, I believe we're in difficult times. Uh, when I was being raised in the 50s and early 60s as a child, I turned 13 in 1963. So, <laughs> uh, But the, the early 60s and the, uh, and the 50s were just a different time. It wasn't a perfect time. We had segregation. We had a lot of things that were probably needed to be changed in our society. But you know what? Boys were boys. Girls were girls. Not too many people were confused about that issue. Uh, we knew marriage was between a man and a woman. And uh, like the Bible said, uh, I remember on the block I lived on, uh, probably a dozen houses. I cannot remember anybody was divorced on that block. Uh, families were pretty much intact. That was, that was true in the 40s and 50s in, in every ethnicity. In fact, uh, in, in some areas of the country, uh, African Americans, uh, the men were in the home more than it was with, with Anglo, uh, European people. Uh, and that, that's desperately changed today. That's one of the problems in the African American community. We prayed in school. We didn't think anything about it. Had devotions in school. We had blue laws. Uh, some people didn't like that, but uh, you couldn't go shopping on Sunday. But it was a, a way... Uh, that we reverenced the Lord. Our doors were unlocked. I went to William Street School in Goldsboro, North Carolina, down on William Street, downtown Goldsboro. Lived out in the suburbs then, uh, out near the hospital out there. And I, I rode my bicycle to school. I walked to school. I came home. That was three miles. I don't know what that was. But I wouldn't let my child <laughs> walk through Goldsboro like that today. Uh, abortion was illegal. Uh, pornography was illegal. We didn't have uh, smut houses or what is that thing, the Mustang Ranch or whatever it is it used to be. Uh, we didn't have those things, and, you know, we would vote them down. Uh, movies didn't have ratings. Didn't have to have GP or G or whatever, you know, because uh, we, we just sort of policed ourselves. TV, Father Knows Best, and, you know, uh, Leave It to Beaver, Andy Griffith, and a ton more, Ozzie and Harriet. Uh, there were no mass shootings that I can remember. Uh, I went to college in 1968, ACOC dorm, East Carolina University, up on the top of the hill, and we just walked in and out of that dormitory day and night, anytime. Doors were always unlocked. I took Daniel, my oldest son, to East Carolina in, when did I take him? 1997, maybe. Uh, I went to the door, to the dorm to open it. Could not open it. You know, it was my generation that came along in the late 60s and said, oh, we want free, we want liberty, we want, we want to do whatever we want to do. It's your thing, baby. Let me tell you who to sock it to, you know. I mean, well, you know, we, we, 
we, we, we rebelled. I didn't rebel that much, but a lot of people did. I did have my hair down to about here, but a lot of them had it down to here, the men. Uh, you know, uh, we, we're going to be free. We're going to be set free. We were just going to, woo, society, we're, we're going to do what we want to do now. You know, and, and we're going to have freedom. And I go up to the dorm 30 years later to open it. I can't open the dorm because they're afraid. They're afraid somebody's going to get in that dorm and, and do something wrong. You didn't have that fear back then might happen occasionally. So, you know, you, you can say society is better in a lot of ways today, and it is, but I tell you, in terms of morals, in terms, terms of security, in terms of uh, walking down the streets, in terms of locking your doors, I, I, didn't, I think I didn't finish that. I went to William Street School and left the door unlocked. My parents both worked. And I came home in the afternoon. There was no key under the mat. I opened the door. We had neighbors. We trusted our neighbors, and they watched out for one another. That, I, I read Thomas Sowell, who grew, grew up in Harlem, and he says the same thing about Harlem in the 40s and early 50s. Thomas Sowell, who's, who's an African-American, a very wise man, said he wouldn't walk in where he grew up in the neighborhood. He grew up in the broad daylight today. So we've lost a lot, and the reason for that is we've turned away from God. Today, uh, we have abortion. We have infanticide today. I'm telling you all this because this is the burden I have for our society. People say it's okay to abort babies. Uh, don't, don't think, and now we've gone, you know, you, you take one leap in that, in that road where I want to be free and I want to be libertine and I want to do whatever in the world I want to do, and the next you realize you've gone another step and you've gone another step. So we've gone from abortion now to infanticide where you can lay the baby aside after it's born and the doctor and the mother can discuss whether that child is worth uh, sustaining life. Uh, we've got gender confusion. People are denying what their chromosomes tell them they are, what their plumbing tells them they are. Didn't have to worry about open bathrooms when I was growing up. Uh, worried about your children going into a bathroom. And, you know, here, in, you know, I know you're sitting there thinking, we don't have it that bad. Well, we don't have it that bad here in Kenley. Every now and then in our schools, we'll have prayer. You try that in Raleigh. Try it in Raleigh and see how well it goes over. Try it in Charlotte. Try it somewhere else. These people are, are ang they get angst. They get angst uh, when, when you start talking about God and faith and, and that's one reason I have a burden I want us to keep it like it is here I want us to, to draw upon God our, the founders of our nation said <laughs> on the back of that pamphlet you got there, there there's, some, uh, <clears throat> there's some quotes there, James John Adams our constitution was made for a moral and religious people, it's wholly inadequate to the government of any other, Thomas Jefferson I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever Je Jefferson who owned slaves was talking about slavery, he said slavery needs to end but it just wasn't the thing you could say, well, let's go end slavery today. It was an institution that had been there for, uh, you know, a couple hundred years. And so it's just not easy to end, but he wanted to, you know. Uh, George Washington, the same. Martin Luther King, the same. Uh, they believe that, that God is, is, is what we need in our country. Today, there, there are states that are legalizing prostitution. Uh, Same-sex marriage is, is something that's uh, okayed. People suppress people of faith. Uh, there are people who try to suppress people of faith uh, and instruct them to keep their faith, faith to themselves. Uh, and these are the people who wanted prayer removed from school, Bible reading removed from school, Bible instruction. But the thing is, they replaced uh, Christianity and, and, and Judeo-Christian belief with another religion. It's called humanism or secularism or you know, existentialism, there's a lot of names it can go by, but it all means the same thing. It's, it's, it's atheism. So our kids go to school today, and you can't tell them about God, but you tell them all about uh, things that are maybe a little more subtle in the way it comes across, but you tell them all about uh, godless things. You tell them it's okay. And again, in our, in, our, in our little area here, it's not maybe as bad as it is in some others, but I, I read... Things going on, just, you know, down uh, 50 miles from here, 100 miles from here, and, and how teachers are being handcuffed and they can't say certain things in the classroom, can't have a Bible on their desk. Uh, we can still do that here. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. But don't think it's like that everywhere. Uh, uh, drag queens. Y'all seen that in the libraries? Drag queens. I'm talking about people 
who look terrible, look like a devil, face painted white, a man trying to be a woman, and, and, and horns on their heads and mascara and, and red lipstick and everything else. And they're sitting down there with little five, six-year-olds teaching them that their style of life is okay. And you need to accept it. I, I hope that does not come to the Kenley Library. But it's happened in, in several cities in the state already. How, in the, how did we get to this place? And I can go on and go on and just, it'll just discourage you. <laughs> There's so much happening today that is just outright wrong. But we can't say it's wrong because you're wrong. It isn't any more wrong than my wrong or your truth isn't any more truthful than my truth. Yeah, and that's, that's where we've come. When we, when we quit relying on the Bible to be the standard of truth, then it goes back to what it says in Judges. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And that's what we're doing today. You cannot run a democracy like that. You cannot do it. It will, it will fail. It's already beginning to do that. Uh, people are losing confidence in our judicial system. Uh, our cops are being beaten up on the streets. New York City, Chicago. It, 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 we're living in a difficult time. And, and people blame America's pitfalls today on everything else but what it actually is. I've been doing a lot of studying on Afro-American culture lately and, and education and how they, they lag behind the young black men, especially the white men, and way out under uh, uh, the Asian uh, men. Uh, and and in, in the 40s and the 50s, African-American men were, were right there on the same level with everybody else. And today, there's 20, 30, 40 percentage points difference in their high school graduation rate, uh, in their incarceration rate, uh, in their passing standardized testing rate. Great disparity. Well, what happened? Everything was good back in the 40s and 50s in, in their education system. In some of the major cities in, in America. Well, everybody wants to blame it on poverty today or blame it on racism. That's not it. My daddy lived in some of the worst poverty anybody could ever live in, the Great Depression. They were poor, and they were smart. African Americans lived in the Great Depression, and they were poor, and they, they put a priority on education. So I, I, I'm spending too much time on this, but I, I really want to set, set, set you up for this. Y'all get ready. I'm getting ready to set you up. Who is to blame for this? Who is to blame for it? Well, we can, we can blame. I, 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 boy, I, I put down a lot of organizations here, you know. We can blame politicians, legislators, judges, the Supreme Court. We can blame uh, uh, past presidents, presidents now. We can blame now. We can blame the NEA in some cases. We can blame uh, the SPLC, Southern Poverty uh, Law Center. You know, we can blame uh, NARAL, National Abortion Rights. We, man, there's a list of people we can blame. But the biggest culprit to why America is turning away from God, and we're beginning to see all this stuff come along, and if something's not done, if we don't, if we don't have a revival, if we don't have a spiritual awakening in our country, it's going to get worse. Now, you can sit here and stick your head in the sand, and, and you can hope, and, uh, you know, but, but we need to be doing something. Prayer. We need to realize what God's called us to do. But the biggest culprit to me today, and, and why we're where we are today, drag queens in libraries. Teaching the children, and nobody saying, "Well, wrong, wrong, no." Is the church? We're not standing up. We're not bold, and we're, we're we're fearful of what we might lose if I stand up and I say something. Uh, the problem Abraham Lincoln summed it up in 1863 when a great war was ravaging our nation. We've forgotten God. We no longer think we're accountable to God. Let me ask you this. If you went to a community and everybody in that community believed in Jesus Christ and they believed he was their savior and it was the only way they could be saved was submit to him 
if they believed that he was the Lord of life and the Bible was the word of God and, and we needed to follow the word of God, we needed to love everybody, we needed to love even our enemies and we needed to do the moral commandments, obey the moral commandments that the Bible says and everybody in that community believed that and tried to pattern their lives out and be a disciple of Jesus Christ, what kind of community would that be? Do what? Glorious. Glorious. Would you need as many policemen? Judges? What has Christ called us to do? Go make disciples. Be light. Be salt. You know, when I stepped down here as pastor, I told y'all I was not retiring. I don't know how many people come up to me and say, how do you like retirement? I said, I don't know. You know, I've, I've been working, and, and I haven't done nearly what I thought I was going to do because I was trying to move myself out. It's not that I didn't love y'all and love church and love the body of Christ, but it was that there's just so many things you have to do as a pastor. You've got to administrate. You've got you to, you know, you just, you just, you just, just got a lot of stuff. Y'all, if y'all ever held a job and had a supervisory role, you know what I'm talking about, dealing with people, you know, having to get people to do what you want them to do. And I thought, well, I, I'm just... Praise God, I, I've got an opportunity now. I can step, step aside and get somebody better than me in here, and, and I can go do, just be freed up to do what God has called me to do. And that's where I feel like I've failed, and uh, I've done some things, and, and I'm happy for what I've done. And th- that's what I wanted to share with you uh, this morning for the last few minutes. And I'm going to get you out of here. I, I swore I would to myself. Uh, get you out of here in pretty good order. Uh, I want to tell you, why, 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 are you, why are you telling me this, George? I already know this. Why are you telling me? Well, most of you in here, with a few exceptions, are around my age. Give or take a few. And we know what it was to live like in the 50s. And not have bars on your windows. In the 60s. We know, we know what was wrong in the 60s and the 50s, too. It needed to be straightened out, but... As far as I said, as far as security and peace of mind, there was so much more of that than there is today. How are they going to know? How are the younger people going to know if we don't talk to them? Because they're growing up in, a, in an environment, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a culture that this is normal. It's what they grew up with. And, and we're not going to be here forever. And we're going to stand before God and we're going to give an account. So uh, if you've got your Bibles, you can turn to them. I've got it on the screen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 through 21. I'm going to look at it just for a few minutes today. But I've got up there, we are still ambassadors for Christ. You do not retire from being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Y'all know what an ambassador is. He goes and represents your country in a foreign land. Well, we are Christians. Our home is in heaven with Jesus. And this, the world, is a foreign land. The ruler of this world is Satan, the Bible tells us. And he's out his best to destroy it and, 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 and deceive people and lie. And, 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 and we are ambassadors. We've been called out of his glorious light into uh, this world to show forth his light in this world as ambassadors for Christ. So, we're ambassadors. And I've said enough about the problems of the world. Yep. It's not on. It is on. It's on. <laughs> you can do it back there too. There we go. Therefore, if anyone... Is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You've heard that verse a lot. I love this verse. You know, if you're in here and you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and he's come into your life, you are a new creation. Old things have passed away. You still got a tendency to want to do some of those old things, you know, it crops up every now and then, but you know better. You know what you should be doing, and you know it's better for you to do the things that, that, that have been opened to your eyes, your eyes have been opened to. And, and, and so, you know, uh, we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit if we're in Christ. Uh, hey, we're a new creation. Uh, we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. We're, we're, we're reborn, born from above. We're, you know, you should have some joy. 
in your life. You know, I was in Sunday school Sunday, and the teacher was teaching it, and he was talking about drunkenness, being don't be drunk, uh, don't be drunk, but, uh, oh, what's the word in Ephesians 5? Uh, uh, be, be filled with the Spirit, don't be drunk. Uh, and, and I said, have you ever noticed that? The analogy, the comparison with being filled in the Spirit is with being drunk. Now, that's a crazy analogy. But if you think, go back to Acts 2 on the first day of Pentecost, they're all jumping out in the streets at 9 o'clock in the morning, and what are they? They're happy. They're excited. They're joyous. They're bold. And the people come up and say, y'all are drunk. Well, why did they accuse them of being drunk? Because they were happy. They were joyous. They had just gotten filled with the Holy Spirit, and they couldn't contain it. They wanted other people to see it. They didn't really, I don't think they really thought about what they were doing. I think they just ran out and said, woo you know, <laughs> this is good. This is better than being drunk. Because drunk, you can feel that way for a little while, but then you're going to start feeling bad. And if you keep drinking, you're going to feel even worse. You know, this is better than being drunk. So that's what we should be doing. If every, if every one of us in this room like this were acting this way in front of our children and our grandchildren, we got excited about Jesus. You know what the teacher told me, son? God bless his soul. Well, I know a lot of people that act like that, and it's all fake. And there are. But, man, we ought to be acting like that. People ought to look at us and say, man, give me a, tell me. Give me a reason for, for what's in you, man. I, 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 Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. We, this, is, this is our ministry. It's what we should be doing, how we should be serving God, reconcil reconciling the world. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God hung, sent Jesus. Jesus hung on the cross. He died for our sins so that we could be reconciled to God, so our sins could be forgiven, uh, reconciled. Me reconcile means to restore a relationship that's broken. And, and God restored that relationship with Jesus Christ. We can know him. We can get excited. We can get filled with the Spirit so good that we feel like we're drunk, you know. Uh, I mean, we, we, can, we, can, we can experience all the promises of God in Christ Jesus our Lord because he reconciled the world to himself by dying on the cross for his sins, not imputing our trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So, God the Father sent Jesus and God the Father was wanting to reconcile the world. He sent his son. His son reconciled the world to himself. And now he sent us to go reconcile the world. We're the ministers. We have the ministry of reconciliation. We are to go and, 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 and get people back in right relationship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's mine and your job. Who else is going to do it if we don't do it? And I said at the beginning of this, this is why our country's in such dire straits today because... We're not doing it as we should. God in us, the body. We are the church, but the church is not a building. The church is not programs. And don't sit here today and think I'm preaching at you. I'm preaching to myself because I start preaching and I think, oh man, how miserable a job I'm doing. Verse 20. Nope, too far. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God... We're pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God to him. Uh, as I said, we're, we're ambassadors in a foreign country. You know, and, and I want to be an ambassador. That's what I want to do. I, I want to be, represent Jesus. Don't want to retire. As I said, I, I've gotten into a, a new phase uh, of ministry and, and I want it to grow. I invite you to come down to the guest room I'm calling it. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, that's going to be the office or base of uh, operations. But I've already been out on the streets talking to people and passing out literature. And I want to continue to do that. And so if you see me with a tent or a, a little wagon or something with literature in it, feel free to stop. Don't ride by and say, what's that crazy fool doing? But uh, stop and, and see. That's what I hope we'll do. So the guest room. Is, is the building down here, the old Gospel Kenley Music Hall, 208 West 2nd Street. I've uh, done a lot of work on it, trying to fix it up so that I can invite people in and people say, this is a nice place. 
You know, I like this. I, I wouldn't mind having a Bible study here. I wouldn't mind eating here. I wouldn't mind, you know, doing a lot of things here. Because, you know, it used to stink. <laughs> The old building. In fact, one lady came in after I'd remodeled it, and she'd been to a meeting before I remodeled it, and she said, it doesn't stink anymore. <laughs> anyway, uh, my goal is reconciliation. Seeing us be reconciled to Jesus Christ, and the only thing that can reconcile this world to Jesus Christ, I mean to, to, to God, is, is Jesus Christ. So I have five things that are essential for reconciliation. These are things that I have in this room. Uh, one is creation. These are things that, that interrelate to one another, and, and we, need, we need these things. We need people to know these things today. Man, if they were teaching this in the schools today, our kids would come out a lot better, I really believe, fully believe, if they were able to teach this. And instead, they, they don't teach it. You say, well, they don't teach the Bible. No, they don't teach the Bible, but they don't even teach about creation. They teach about evolution. We all evolved out of slime. And we're going nowhere. There's no meaning. There's no purpose to life. I don't know if I'm a male or a female. They haven't read the Bible. So let's look at it. Creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And, and, and you know, scientists today say that there was a, a moment of singularity. Look that word up. <laughs> Basically means there was a moment when nothing became something. It just happened. Singularity. You'll hear PhDs talk about this all the time. Well, my Bible says, in the beginning, God spoke the world into existence, and it came into being. I, I, I think it's more, much more, uh, it takes less faith to believe that, and it does, there was a moment of singularity, and there was nothing, and all of a sudden, there's a universe. So, Genesis 2.27, God made us in his image. People need to know that. These people are shooting one another and mass shootings and killing and, and, and you know, doing all that. They need to know they were made in God's image, and we all were. And life is sacred, and life is, life, life, there, there's sanctity of life, you know. And it also says he made us what? Male and female. That needs to be taught. The Bible says it. Uh, Christ, uh, this is the crux of the whole thing. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, Jesus is the only one who can reconcile the world. Get us together. Get the different races. Get the different denominations. He's the only one who can bring us together because he, he has the power to do that. He's the only one uh, who, 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 can, who can bring unity and understanding. And that, that, th these are the things that I want to promote in the guest room. I, I want people to understand this because all these are tied together and we need to understand this in order to, uh, to, to grow together. And the main, the main thing is Christ. Uh, country. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The founders of our nation, as I said, knew this. Uh, they, uh, those quotes on the back said, you know, religion and morality are essential for, for a Republican form of government, for a democracy. You can't have it. You can't have people, everybody doing their own thing. You know, you, you got to do, you got to have a standard. You got, everybody's got to submit to that standard of right and wrong. If you don't have it, it's going to be a crazy world. So the founders realized that. Communion. Uh, the word communion, I know we all think, hey, we're going to have the Lord's communion. We're going to have some ju juice and one, uh, uh, bread. Well, communion really means oneness, unity, uh, commonality. And so he is made from one blood every nation. We're all the same race, the human race. There are not different races. This needs to be taught because that's, that's one of the things that's dividing our country. Well, you black and I'm white and I'm red and I'm yellow. No, there ain't nobody I ever seen yellow, red, black, and white. I know we sing that little song. Ain't nobody red. Nobody yellow. We are all, and y'all, I've taught you this, some of you before, we're all what color? We're brown. Shades of brown. What separates us is culture, not color. Culture. And we, can, we, we, we can get beyond color. We, we need to tell people, you know, that, that we're all the same race. Let's get together. And commandments, the word of God. Is living and powerful. It's absolute truth. You gotta have a source of absolute truth. You send your kids off to Harvard, Yale, uh, Chowan, uh, Barton, anywhere today, and they're most likely not gonna be told that there's an absolute truth. They're gonna be told truth is relative. Truth is what you wanna make it to be. Don't tell anybody else they're right or wrong because you don't know. You can have your right and wrong, but you can't impose your right and wrong on anybody else. Well, that is not the way this country was founded. And it's not what the Bible says. There's one right, there's one wrong, 
it's found in God's word, so we need to do that. Okay, I'm going to give you a little view of the guest room. Uh, on your left are some chairs. I've got it seated. We're looking to the front, and uh, up there is a, a piano that was donated, and there's speakers. Uh, Matt Grubb and John Paul have put speakers in. I, I mean, they're, they're, what are they, 1978 speakers, but <laughs> they weren't good. <laughs> <laughs> they got the big woofers and tweeters on them, man. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's good. But got it set up. I can take up chairs, put the chairs down. Uh, then the next slide over. Uh, where are we going? Anyway, I have, I have, you can leave it there. I have walls that I've got literature on each wall that talk about these five themes of reconciliation. You know, the Bible, the, the commandments, communion, our country, things like that so that people can walk around and look at it and at least begin to understand sort of what it's about. I got one about we're all one race, the human race. Uh, notice the little pamphlet I gave you. What color is most of the color? It's brown. I call this the brown room. I didn't intend to do it, but <laughs> it just started turning out brown. I thought, well, this is a God thing. You know, it's going to be a brown room. Uh, so that's what I'm doing. I've got, I got people, I got, I got a lot of good African-American brothers and sisters who, who tell me, I, I, they're, they're quick to tell me now, we're all brown. I mean, <laughs> I love it. Uh, they, they, there's so much more commonality. All right, uh, there's another one. There's a card I've got, that, that, a business card, the back of it's talking about the same thing. Uh, and there's methods I want to use to communicate these themes. So you say, what are you doing down there? Some people say, are you serving hot dogs? Are you serving coffee? Well, yeah, anything's open. Anything's open. But uh, I want to do workshops and conferences and seminars. I've got DVDs. I've got that big 65-inch TV. I want to have something going down there all the time. If anybody walks by, steps in, they'll have an opportunity to see, be, be enlightened, educated, on what's going on. I, I want to do biblical worldview studies. I want people to understand that if you don't have a biblical worldview, if you don't view the world the way God created it and intended it to be, you, you're, going to have a, you're going to have not as prosperous and wonderful a life. You, you need to understand this. Uh, discipleship groups, I've already got uh, some discipleship groups meeting in there. I've got about three or four guys we meet in there. One group meets at 6 o'clock in the morning uh, on Thursdays. And y'all can come too. But uh, me... Joey Holland, Rick Stewart, and Ricky Richardson meet at 6 o'clock. Rick drives all the way from the coast <laughs> to be here at 6 o'clock. Of course, he, he doesn't sleep anyway, except when he's driving. Uh, <laughs> uh, social gatherings. I want to have some teas and coffees and pastries and maybe even get uh, five or six people, ten, maybe no, not, not large groups over there. Let's sit down and let's talk and let's listen. I've learned a lot lately listening to people who, who are, who are African-American who were raised uh, in, in segregation. And the way they came through it, many of them, the ones that succeeded, the ones who succeeded didn't hold a chip on their shoulder. You know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And, and they weren't victims. And they were victims in a way, but they didn't brand themselves as victims. That's part of the problem today. Everybody wants to say not just that race, but everybody, that, that, that ethnicity, everybody. I'm, I'm a bit, I want to have a Christian business group that meets once a month, have a breakfast, uh, so that they can look not only at praying, but look at our community. What could we do to make our community better, to enhance business? I, I've said before, I've said before that I want people to ride through Kinley and realize there's a difference. What is wrong with that town? Sort of like Acts chapter 2. Are those people all drunk? What's wrong with them? I didn't see any alcohol, but man, they're sure happy. And they're, and they're sensitive, and they wait on you, and they open the door for you. You know, they're kind to you, they're considerate, and they act like they love one another. And, you know, I see all different ethnicities there, and they all get along so well. And, and I, everywhere I went, I, saw, I, went, I went through this uh, place called Storm and Normans, and I got in the drive through line, and there they had the Ten Commandments. You know, right there, plain as day on the wall. And I go in a building and I, and I see something about Jesus. And he said, man, think about that. If people were riding through here like a lot of people do and were seeing, seeing evidence of Christ and they saw a difference in the people, got to be a difference in the people, folks. Your walk's got to match your talk. But then they would go to Florida, they'd go to New York and they'd say, man, I had the greatest experience. What a town that was. Well, that, that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're ambassadors for Christ. Civic meetings, uh, Martin Luther King group meets there now. 
And, and they're a group that doesn't want to just promote their ethnicity. They want to help the community. They, they got projects they want to do. Uh, Kenley Air Ministries is meeting there. The Kenley Ministerial Association, the pastors meet there and several others. And then I want the pastors to pray once a month. I want, I want to get the pastors together and just begin to pray. Because if, if a church does not, is not led by a spirit-filled pastor, most likely a congregation is not going to be spirit-filled. So I want to get to pastors. I want to encourage them. I, I'm telling you, being a pastor myself, I know what it's like. to get. And I told you all why I'm going out to Bethany now. It's, it's not because I'm mad and upset. It's because my son needs somebody to encourage him. And it's very evident. And then we're going to have Seeking Shalom events. Seeking Shalom events are, uh, that's Paul Dunneman over at the Methodist Church is wanting to do that and, and where we can, uh, help people, train people, mentor people, get a job, keep a job, uh, advance in their job, have confidence in themselves, uh, that kind of thing. And then the last thing, y'all know this, Matthew 28, 18, uh, we're, we're commissioned to go and make disciples. We're commissioned to go and make disciples. And, you know, I, I just closed today with asking you, how well are you doing? How well am I doing? I can tell you I'm not doing nearly what I want to do. But don't let that defeat you. Just ask God to forgive you and go on. God loves you. He sent his son to die on the cross for you. He will move mountains for you, he says it. Ask anything in my name and I'll do it. He wants us to be light. He wants us to be salt. He, he supplies all the resources that we need to be this. Start opening doors for people. Start smiling. Start laughing. Be sure you're seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit when you do that, or I'll be fake and it won't be, mean anything. <laughs> Seek God. Get in the Word of God. Pray. Seek His face. And, and then seek to go out everywhere you go. But this is really hard for me. <laughs> everywhere you go, you want to be an ambassador. In the checkout line, wherever you go. This, this is something... I, I, I forget sometimes. I, I get in a hurry, and, I, and I'm wanting to get my food, and I'm wanting to get my stuff checked out. <laughs> and I forget, no, this is not the real reason I'm here. I'm here to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And if we don't, folks, if we don't, our grandchildren will have to have that. And, and, and there, there again, with your grandchildren and your children and everybody you know, with your neighbors, tell them about Jesus. And live Jesus. Show them Jesus. God bless y'all. Thank you. Oh, I'm supposed to have a prayer. And I got you out before 12, but I still preached a long time. I'm sorry. Let's pray. Father, thank you for everyone here and their attentiveness, uh, Lord, most of them anyway. And uh, Lord, just uh, thank you that, that your word's true and that you do love us. And help us, help me, Lord, to walk in this life uh, in your love, in your peace and joy, in, in your Holy Spirit, Lord, that others can see Jesus in me. And and they can see the hope that I have in you. And, Lord, I just pray for our community. I pray for our nation. I pray, uh, Lord, that, that we would turn to you. There wouldn't be so much divisiveness. And only you can heal. Only you can reconcile. We ask our prayer now, uh, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we also, Lord, ask that you bless this food uh, to the nourishment of our bodies. Thank you for this time of fellowship. Thank you for everyone here. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.